Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. My name is Shepard Woltmer. I'm the Director of Plastics Initiatives at Ocean Conservancy, and I want to thank you for taking the time to join us today. We know everyone is really busy, so we appreciate you um, taking the time to be with us. I'm going to set the stage for our panel and then introduce our panelists. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, about the plastics problem in the United States, and then we will um, have a panel discussion and Q&A. So the United States, I think we all know, has a plastics problem. Uh, according to the most recent data available, Americans generated 35.6 million tons of plastic in 2018. Um, to put that in ocean terms, that is more than 215,000 blue whales. And since I'm an ocean person, I have to think about it that way. At 14.5 million tons, plastic packaging waste is the largest single component. And only 8.7% of that waste is recycled. The rest of it is destined for landfills, incinerated, exported, or in the worst case, it ends up in the ocean. And the reality has enormous impacts on the environment. Plastic pollution has become one of the most visible problems of our time. And our just released International Coastal Cleanup Report for 2021 confirms what anyone can see with their own eyes. Nine out of the top 10 littered items found on beaches and waterways around the world last year were plastic. So for the sake of the planet, we cannot continue this way. However, this is a complex problem and there is no single solution. We need a suite of actions to reduce our use of plastic, to better manage the plastic that we do need, and to clean up the plastic that's already in the environment. We've been thinking about this for a while. At Ocean Conservancy, um, we put out a playbook in 2019, a plastics policy playbook, that evaluated the full range of potential options to combat plastic waste. Um, we we um, gauged these measures, we took 42 measures, we gauged them against rigorous environmental, social, and economic criteria. And of the 42 measures that we considered, Extended Producer Responsibility, or EPR, ranked the highest. So there are a lot of ways to think about EPR. There are a lot of definitions, but perhaps the simplest way to think about it is that Extended Producer Responsibility makes producers financially responsible for their post-consumer waste. Uh, our playbook work focused on South and Southeast Asia, but we are seeing concrete evidence that, especially when combined with other complementary policy measures, EPR can really move the needle to increase plastic recycling. So in the European Union, for example, 41.5% um, of plastic packaging waste was recycled in 2018, a rate that's more than four times higher than our own recycling. While there are many different flavors of EPR, they share one important common advantage, and that is to provide dedicated, ongoing, and sufficient funding for collecting and processing post-consumer waste. While policymakers set the goals and targets for EPRs, the responsible stakeholders determine how to meet those targets. The good news is that there is a growing consensus around the need for EPR in the US. Our collective presence here today is a demonstration that stakeholders across the board understand that we need systemic and ambitious action on EPR to keep trash out of the ocean. This is already starting to happen at the state level. We have EPR, um, both Maine and Oregon recently enacted EPR legislation, and the time is ripe for federal level EPR policy. So to talk more about this, we have a great panel here today to offer a range of perspectives on the issue. So um, let me introduce the panel briefly. Andrew Aulisi um, is my co-host for the event and also the Vice President of Global Environmental Policy in PepsiCo's Public Policy Center, a part of its corporate affairs. He leads the development of PepsiCo's global policies on an approach to key environmental regulatory issues, such as sustainable packaging, agriculture, water, and climate energy policy. Andrew has over 25 years of experience working in the intersection between business and sustainability. Before joining PepsiCo, he was the Director of Sustainability Affairs at Credit Suisse and focused on the integration of environmental and social issues into investment banking and asset management. Andrew spent a decade in the nonprofit sector and led the markets research program at the World Resources Institute in Washington. He started his professional work as an underwriter in the Environmental Liability Division of AIG, where he provided clients with environmental risk management products. Andrew has a Master of Science in Environmental Science and a Bachelor's Degree in Biology. Our next um, panelist is Dylan DeThomas. Dylan leads the Policy and Public Affairs team at the Recycling Partnership, directing advocacy efforts for the organization at the local, state, and federal levels. While at the partnership, Dylan has worked with all the teams across the organization, serving as a spokesperson and stakeholder representative in num numerous settings, working to communicate, collaborate, and find consensus on complex issues. Roberta Elias um, is a Policy and Government Relations Specialist with 20 years of experience working in Washington, DC. Roberta is currently the Director of Policy and Government Affairs at the World Wildlife Fund, WWF. 
In this role, she facilitates development of policy platforms across the organization while spearheading conservation issues within her own portfolio. In her time at WWF, she has advanced bills, regulations, and appropriations on a variety of topics, including materials management, trade, fishery sustainability, and spatial oceans management. And finally, we have Chris Adamo, the Vice President at Danone North America for Federal and Industry Affairs, assisting one of the world's largest B Corps with strengthening the role of business in driving social and environmental good for all. He helps Danone North America navigate a confluence of issues related to public policy and partnerships to help Danone grow and provide healthier options. Prior, Chris spent over a decade at the highest levels of the US government working on issues related to the agriculture, climate change, and nutrition. Most recently, Chris was the Chief of Staff for the White House Council on Environmental Quality from 2015 to 2017, where he helped design and implement policies to mitigate and adapt to climate change, as well as manage nat various natural resource matters. Previously, Chris worked for 10 years in the US Senate as an advisor to various US senators, both Democrats and Republicans. He led, for example, the US Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry under the leadership of Senator Debbie Stabenow as its staff director. So now I'd like to turn it over to the panel. First up, my co-host, Andrew Alisi. Andrew, the floor is yours. Thanks, Shepard. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining this event today. I want to thank uh, Ocean Conservancy for co-hosting co this and also thank all of our panelists for being a part of this. Um, to get started with my remarks, I, I'd, I'd like to explain quite simply why you know, PepsiCo is, is here today to talk about extended producer responsibility um, for packaging waste. Um, so PepsiCo is a consumer packaged goods company. Um, you know, packaging is, is right in our industry's name. It's, it's essential to our business. Uh, essential to serving our, our customers and consumers. It has enormous utility, but we, we, we all recognize, all of us here on this panel recognize that we, ha we have a problem with packaging waste. Um, too much of it, you know, at the end of its life is, you know, winding up in landfills or incinerators or worse, you know, in, in the environment. And so we, we need to shift. We need to shift to more sustainable packaging, you know, solutions for the long-term sustainability of our, of our industry. And you know, there, there are many things that we can do to achieve that sustainability. We can reduce unnecessary packaging materials. We can introduce reuse systems, you know, but for essential packaging um, that, that we can, you know, that can't go into a kind of a reuse system, um, we need, to build much better recycling systems. So at the end of the life of the packaging, that material can be recaptured, reprocessed, and, and put into new packaging or products. Um, you know, Chevron was getting at you know, some of the, the deficiencies that we see in, in recycling today. So in the US, I, I mean, our recycling rates can increase dramatically, uh, not only for plastics, but for all materials. I mean, in our packaging at PepsiCo, we use aluminum, fiber, glass, and plastics, okay? And um, across the board, the recycling rates, you know, are just, uh, just too low. I mean, if you look at residential recycling rates in the US, you know, particularly set aside things like yard waste, and you really just look at the kind of inorganic stuff coming out of people's homes, you know, we're probably at about 25% recycling, which is just unacceptable. And as Shevra mentioned, there are many other places in the world that are achieving much, much higher recycling rates. At the, in the US, we should be striving for at least 50% recycling of residential waste. And that's not a ceiling, that's just a starting point. And, we gotta, and, and then we can press on from there. But I think 50% is a reasonable goal to be shooting for in, 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 you know, in, our, in, our, in the next phase of growth of our recycling systems. But you know, we're going to need much better financing to take us to that level, and we're going to need federal leadership. Now, we're, we're here to talk about extended producer responsibility because it is a financing mechanism for curbside recycling collection. I mean, in the simplest form, it's a fee on, on consumer packaging, and you know, the fee revenue goes to a professional recycling organization that contracts out the money to pay for better collection and sorting of recyclables and other essential system features. Okay, but importantly, I mean, it's not just an investment in recycling, it's an investment in the economy and in the environment. You know, by increasing recycling rates, we drive investment in the clean technology, we conserve natural resources, reduce carbon emissions, 
reduce the need for landfilling and incineration of waste, and reduce litter that winds up on land and then in the marine environment and harms, harms the natural environment. Okay. So, you know, EPR is, is you know, EPR for packaging is relatively new in the US, but it is not a new idea for, you know, a, a range of products or parts of the world. And what I'm getting at is that, you know, EPR is used for things like used paint, batteries, mattresses. I could go on. Um, you can find many, many EPR programs in operation in the United States today. But for packaging waste, it's really taken root more in places like Europe and Canada. Um, in fact, PepsiCo participates in over 30 packaging EPR programs around the world. And indeed, we're, we're beginning to see some states move on it here in the United States. Okay, but the, the, the critical thing is, it's not new. We've gained a lot of experience and familiarity with these systems. We know what works and it can work very well. It can have very strong environmental performance, it can be economically efficient, it can be convenient for consumers. These, these systems work. And so let me just conclude my remarks by you know, drawing on that point about how, you know, how EPR works to explain the opportunity that sits in front of us right now. Okay, most major consumer goods companies that I am aware of are supportive of well-designed EPR. So to put that in really blunt terms, the industry that's going to be regulated, okay, is at the table saying, you know what, we can think we think this can work. So, you know, and, and when you look beyond the, the the regulated industry, the obligated industry, you see many leading NGOs like those on our on our panel today who also think it can work, and, and other industry stakeholders and actors who again you know, see the opportunity here. So there's an, a very, very strong alignment. And because of the experience we have with EPR, we're not coming to the table, you know, just kind of, you know, in a brainstorming mode. I mean, we're coming to the table with a proven model, okay? We have concrete ideas about how to drive the environmental and economic performance of well-designed EPR programs for packaging waste and how to set the, re the, the recycling rate targets how to establish the fee setting mechanisms, the scope, the operation, incentives for sustainability. We have very, very concrete ideas on all of these uh, on all of these matters. So we, you know, I think I, I, on behalf of PepsiCo and the consumer goods industry, I think we just have a lot of constructive input to provide. And I'm really glad that we're all assembled here today for this, this important conversation. Um, I'm gonna conclude my remarks there um, in the spirit of providing, you know, input and guidance. I'm going to drop a link into the uh, chat that um, would take you to um, a uh, paper that was published by the Consumer Goods Forum on uh, well-designed EPR. And uh, thank you for giving me the time. Thank you, Andrew. And I just want to pull out that one line from your from your um, presentation that I really liked, which said that the industries that are going to be regulated are at the table saying this could work. Um, I think that's a pretty powerful message. So um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dylan um, for his perspective on, on the issue. Thank you. Welcome, Dylan. Thank you so much, Shever, and, and thank you to, uh, to our co-hosts, both Ocean Conservancy. Thank you, Shever, and thank you, Andrew, and PepsiCo for including us, and uh, very excited to be uh, alongside my co-panelists here as well. Uh, the Recycling Partnership, uh, for anyone who's not familiar with us on the line, is a national nonprofit that works with companies and communities across the country to help strengthen public recycling systems, which is the, the recycling system that we have currently. And we do that through providing grants to communities, as well as providing technical assistance uh, and best practices to local governments, and also by working on circular economy issues, such as designing for recycling. And I... Um, uh, alongside my 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 uh, colleagues who are uh, experts in the uh, ENGO space as well as in the uh, uh, in the the CPG space, uh, I get to be the the recycling nerd on on the screen here. So uh, and and I always try to take uh, recycling down to its its baseline, which is what what we're doing when we put. Um, uh, you know, a, a can, a bottle, a, a box, or, you know, uh, or, or whatever it might be that's recyclable into your recycling cart is that you're providing manufacturing feedstock that, uh, that will go through a system that will be cleaned up, that will be processed and then turned into something new. And that will displace 
uh, something, you know, the virgin feedstock or the new stuff that would uh, that would come out of it. So, you know, and, and because of that, recycling ultimately, and this is I'm echoing my colleagues here, that recycling means jobs. It's an average of more than 10 times more than throwing stuff in a landfill or incinerating. And according to EPA, for instance, uh, recycling and reuse activities contribute currently right now to uh, 757,000 uh, US jobs. Um, and it's not just an action to do when you're done with that package or magazine, but that again, it's that supply chain. We all remember when supply chains were interrupted at the beginning of COVID, and we, we you know, we, we lost, we lost sight of uh, toilet paper, and in part that was because of recycling supply chain and challenges. And then we also all know that recycling protects the environment and uh, the people in it. So obviously, when you displace that new stuff that you're pulling out of the ground, you're saving resources and creating jobs along the way, and. You know, I, I think it's helpful to think about the recycling system as we have it today as, you know, as not a planned system, not a system that was built out of national policy. There is no national recycling policy currently, but rather, you know, it was supported by and grew from uh, the individual actions and decisions of thousands of communities around the country, uh, sometimes with some coordination at the state level, but oftentimes not. And that's why you have uh, ultimately what is a fairly fractured system, not a system that you would design, uh, not a system that is that is governed by those strong regulations, but rather, you know, that's why sometimes you'll you'll the stuff that you can recycle at home might be different than what you can recycle when you go on vacation or or where you're some someplace else. And policy, in particular, producer responsibility policy, is a way to uh, is a, is a way to provide that rational system or regulatory system to be able to provide recycling for all Americans. Um, we uh, as a as a, uh, an organization recently released a report uh, called the Paying It Forward Report, which identified the great infrastructure needs that the US has. Uh, we identified $17 billion, which would be a combination of both one-time and ongoing uh, costs for infrastructure beyond just operations. Um, and that is, again, it's across the country because just over half the US has the same level of recycling access that it does to trash, meaning that it would be as easy to recycle something as it is to throw away. And that is a capital need and a capital need that currently is on the backs of all of those thousands of communities that I talked about earlier. And that, that the narrative behind that about who, you know, how that should be managed and how that should be regulated has flipped. And what you heard from Andrew at the outset, and I know that Chever echoed this, and I'm going to echo it again, is that producer responsibility is regulation that's supported by the industry that would be regulated, which is the brands. And so you're, you heard from Andrew at PepsiCo, and you'll You'll hear from Chris Adamo from Danone as well, and, and these are companies that, that currently deal with EPR in different countries and provinces around the country and are advocating for producer responsibility right here at home. Um, and, and even even us, we as an organization last year released a policy report that was endorsed that was that was advocating for, again, producer responsibility policy. And so it's something that you see as a, a, a growing shift, something that is definitely a change where the industry was a number of years ago, but, uh, but a really energizing and exciting uh, a push to be able to make sure that we're bringing recycling to everyone and to be able to provide a system that would be equitable and informed to, to provide that access for all Americans um, and, and not just the folks who live in the big cities. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll thank Shever for my time and I'll pass the, the speaking baton. Thank you, Shever. Thank you. So um, just to pull out a couple of threads, Dylan, from your presentation, um, jobs, um, who doesn't like jobs? Everyone likes jobs. And also um, uh, the supply chain issues that we experienced during the beginning of the pandemic um, and the fact that recycling could help address some of those, I think are really key points out of your presentation. So next I'd like to turn it over to Roberta from WWF. Um, WWF. Maybe there was one too many W's in there. So Roberta, um, looking forward to hearing your perspective on the issue. Absolutely, and I apologize to everyone. My uh, computer has decided not to um, go along with my hopes for today. So I don't have my camera on, but I'll try to be as compelling as possible with my voice and uh, keep my five-year-old who's homesick from school quiet. He's a, uh, thinks that the folks there at Pepsi needs to be working on making him more soda um, instead of being on that presentation. But I really appreciate the comments. So um, very briefly, um, so we can get time to actually talk about the issues that have been in front of us today. 
these are the kind of issues that I absolutely love working on, um, where there's consensus and excitement from both public and industry and members of Congress that change is necessary and that change is possible. I really feel like we're at this point now where there's that consensus that moving forward with a modern governance approach would make a big difference for jobs, conservation, and public health outcomes. And we really just need to figure out how to dot the I's and cross the T's to get there. So that's exciting. Um, I don't want to be overly optimistic. There are certainly problems right now. So as we know, um, recycling is governed by 20,000 different municipalities um, in the United States. The laws on the books to govern solid waste management date from the 70s and it really came about before the explosion in disposable items really occurred and where the potential of recycling really is now. We need a federal framework to be able to um, deal with the amount of materials that we're producing and the amount of materials that we're um, disposing of. So I could go into details about the problems with all of the disposable materials that we make, both on the disposal side and on the production side, but I'll focus mm -hmm. on plastics. And that's really because um, plastics are, have captured the imagination. Hold on one second. Okay, I'm now undistracted. Um, apologies, modern life. Um, plastics um, have so clearly captured the attention of the American public and the attention of decision makers. And they're the newest and fastest growing component of the space that we're talking about today. Plastics are relatively new. Um, really, the mass production of pl plastics have only occurred during our lifetimes in about the last six decades. And in that time, six years goes very quickly. 8.3 billion metric tons of plastic materials have been created. And the vast majority of that plastics, I can't even picture 8.3 billion metric tons, but it's a lot, have become waste, 75% of those materials. And if the challenge right now is big, it's about to get much, much bigger. It's expected that by 2050, production of plastics will more than triple. Um, and if you care about the climate impacts um, and efficiencies, which I certainly do, that growth will represent 20% of all fossil fuel consumption or 10 to 13% of the carbon budget. And we're talking about materials that people don't necessarily um, want or need. WWF commissioned public opinion polling and something like 86% of the American public said there's more plastic waste than their households can, um, can handle and that they feel like the government and companies need to come together with solutions to make their lives easier. Um, right now, because there is so much, more, so much stuff and that stuff is anticipated to grow, we're only recycling here in the US 13% of our plastic waste and only 2%, which is close to zero, achieves circularity. And by circularity, I mean where our old product becomes a new one. So 98% of the products that we're using either end up landfilled, disposed of, or incinerated, um, or get recycled, but don't get turned into a new product. Um, we can do better. We've talked a lot here about what a federal framework could look like to do better. I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, and if we really take on that challenge of improving governance for production and disposal, there have been a vast amount of studies that have indicated that we'll see benefits and efficiencies in terms of energy use, um, air and water quality, smog formation, waste consumption, and that will actually save the government money and the Pew Charitable Trust um, estimated that we would create 12 million American jobs. So WWF and the American Beverage Association, I'll put this in the chat, have come up with joint principles for what a system of reduction and extended producer responsibility would look like. Those same principles are supported by our one source coalition, which include the beverages like our friends over at Pepsi, as well as our friends at Danone, Unilever and others, um, and really reflect comments that the chairman of the Environment and Public Works Committee, the nonprofit sector have all really stated in the past. We're looking at a system of reduction, reuse and refill public-private durable funding investments tied to key objectives to achieve circularity and really systems to improve public health and environmental justice outcomes. And we're just really excited that people are here today to really figure out how that's gonna happen. Um, so thank you, Shever. Thank you, Roberta. And thank you also for sort of um, highlighting some of the complexities with the issue, the 20,000 municipalities. I think Dylan touched on that as well. Um, and then also the jobs issue again, um, and sort of the trajectory if we don't take action. So I think all of those are really important points. 
So now I'd like to uh, hand the floor over to our final speaker. And before I do, um, just a note that um, I see some questions already popping up in the Q&A. But if uh, members of our audience have questions, please start putting them in the Q&A so that we can get them lined up. We'll do a little bit of moderated discussion between the panelists, but we'd also want to make sure we have time for audience questions. So Chris, with that, over to you. Thank you, Chevron. Thank you everybody for having me. Uh, I'll be brief, trying to set the table and finish up what everybody has already uh, started to do here for uh, hopefully a rigorous conversation. Um, to know North America, who I work for, is a global food company, much like PepsiCo. And I think one of the takeaways I'd like to leave you with that, rather than just list all our brands that you're probably much more familiar with, just give you a quick snapshot of the types of foods that we offer, because that will give you a, also a snapshot of the type of packaging challenges that we're encountering and need federal policies such as an EPR to deal with. Um, you may know us first and foremost as a yogurt company, so everything from yogurt cups to uh, yogurt bottles, smoothies, uh, tubs that contain 16 ounces of yogurt. We're also a beverage company. We have Evian water and others, uh, so typical water bottle uh, challenges there. And baby food company, Happy Family Baby Food is a key uh, subsidiary of ours, and pouches are a really key component of packaging that allow more families to offer healthy options for their young ones. And so there, we're also a coffee cup company. We're also a plant-based alternative company, uh, brands like Silk. All that is to say that that variety of food and beverage and those variety of brands offer a significant variety of packaging uh, challenges across our portfolio. With that, and patent plastics are a key, key piece of that. Although I should say that paper and fiber are actually the largest by volume uh, packaging material we, we use. So, to think about what is a policy that can help us meet the solutions for society with everybody else, we need EPR to be a way to bring and encompass all the different incentives and funding needs together. Uh, first and foremost, with those, just let's just take plastics for example, there are at least three types of plastics that we predominantly use and need to find solutions for. There are issues like food safety, uh, there are issues of putting a warm or heated food product like fermented yogurt into a cup. There are durability issues. All of these things need to be overcome when we look at different types of recycled or alternative feedstocks. Um, there are challenges that all of us companies are digging into in one way or another. Um, EPR helps accelerate that innovation. It sends the signal to the marketplace at the at the both the processing manufacturing end as well as the consumer products good end which is which is us um, the second piece I'll, I'll quickly leave you with in and dylan touched on this uh, quite well is the national infrastructure so it's great news that states are starting this conversation and we've seen a few epr proposals move through the state legislatures this summer in fact but we're not going to solve the problem which is a national problem just with a handful of states. We're gonna need the federal government to step in and unify this system. If nothing else, for us to be able to send a larger market signal, number one, for all these different types of packaging uh, needs that we have across our portfolio, but to fill that infrastructure gap, the collection, the sorting, and the alternative uh, manufacturing processes that are needed to create these new feedstocks and, and, and reduce the overall waste to the system. Also, I should note, and there's been some great progress on this, and many of you who work on the Hill, thank you for these efforts. There's been some, obviously, Save Our Seas 1, Save Our Seas 2.0. Uh, there's, as I understand it, there's a good chunk of funds in the infrastructure bill, which may pass later this year. All these are great. We thank you for that. However, these are all relatively still significant, important, but small amounts compared to that $17 billion amount that Dylan referenced. And so we have a long way to go there to fill those gaps across all communities. And think about the United States and the challenges we have. Recycling is local. EPR can help local uh, funding, help local municipalities think about how to cover their different gaps, which are going to vary from community to community. And obviously, to, again, provide the set of solutions that we need as a food system, we're going to need that national system, which unifies all the various locals and states. Um, the third piece I'll leave, and then I'll conclude, which is more of a political commentary. This has been a tremendous amount of work by a number of different stakeholders, not just the folks here on, obviously on this call today. And we've made a lot of progress, even just in the past year alone, to build the coalitions that hopefully policymakers can take advantage of. Obviously, first and foremost, with the thought leadership on what the EPR can look like and how we can design a successful uh, EPR moving forward. 
and also the political momentum, hopefully, you know, whether it's the recycling partnership, the US plastics pact, uh, Ocean Conservancy, WWF efforts, these are all important pieces to the coalition puzzle, which we think can really move this forward, not years to come, but hopefully maybe this Congress. Uh, and we're obviously excited to continue that momentum and continue building that traction with you all. So look forward to the conversation uh, today and, and, and beyond. Thank you, Chevron. Thank you, Chris. And just to pull out and highlight a couple of points from, from what you said, um, that point about innovation that EPR can, can, can accelerate innovation, I think that's really important, as well as the infrastructure point. But maybe to get, kick off the questions, I'll go back to that third point you, you made about federal leadership. Um, and state versus federal. So I, I wanted to get your, to dig into that question a little bit more because it was touched on by several of the panelists. Can you give us a sense of why you think federal leadership is, is necessary and what is the role of the state versus the federal? And then I'll open up to the other panelists to join in if they're interested. Well, I think like so much, so many policies that, that we deal with, whether, and I've been a part of in my career, everything from wildlife conservation to water. I worked with Roberta in the past on fisheries policy climate policy, so many strong policies start at the local and state level. And that's a great part of our wonderful part of our system and our culture. And then the next step often is as things develop, as things mature, as good ideas start to take root, the federal government can step in and create a unified system across the board. Number one, because the problems that we are facing require scale of a national uh, size. And two, we need uniformity. We need the clarity across the system so that we can be sending the same signal to all the various parts of our marketplace so that plastics in, in one corner of the country are being dealt with the same and, and hopefully to higher standards in other parts of the country as well. Thank you. Do any of the other panelists wanna jump in on that question? Yeah, I'd like to chime in and just say that it's, uh, it, it, it's important to have as a, the recycling system that's consuming the materials needs to be able to plan for those, to plan and identify where they need to build the infrastructure to be able to adjust for that increasing supply. And having a, a regulatory framework that's federal is a lot easier to integrate rather than state by state. This is not a state by state issue. This is a federal issue. And, you know, I mean, for those of us who spend time traveling pre COVID, maybe your traveling's coming back, you know, you want to be able to recycle the same stuff where you go. And, and it's important to have that type of framework to be able to, to, to have a, a for businesses to be able to rationally respond to that uh, to that framework at, at a federal level, just easier than doing it a state by state. A patchwork can be really challenging to operate in, both from the folks that we're talking on this line, but also from the recycling system that's there waiting for the feedstock to come into it. Any of the other panelists would like to weigh in? Just, just fairly briefly, I, I would just say that I, I think what we're talking here about is really is, is federal guidance and minimum standards. But make no mistake, I mean. Recycling is still going to get done at the state, state and local level. We just need greater uniformity and connectivity, you know, ac across the country, so that it's not this totally fragmented, you know, system that's going in six different directions at the same time. And just to make sure, Roberta, did you want to did you want to yeah, add? Just just very quickly, um, I, I agree with everything that said, especially Chris's remarks about the fact that having states move forward really sets the model and has so many times before for what the federal government should do and what success looks like. There is a way to get at what Andrew was highlighting. There is a way for the federal government to set a framework and a set of, a, a set of objectives that would create clear rules of the road and, and processes for the public and for industry um, that can really be implemented flexibly over different regions and over different states. I think we can really have our cake and eat it too here. One part of the country, you know, Tennessee is not the same as Alaska, California is not the same as Maine, but what we want to have happen here is really the same. We want, we want consumers, the public to have consistent and easy access to recycling. We want to make sure that the amount of stuff that we're producing is at a scale that any system could actually um, cope with and recycle and turn into new products. And we want companies that have made such public and important commitments to using recycled content to have clear assurances that that recycling content will exist and will be of high enough quality to use. And getting to that kind of vision really requires some sort of federal framework. And that doesn't mean that Tennessee will become Maine, will become Alaska, but that will mean that we'll all start rowing in one direction. 
Thank you, uh, Roberta. And, and building on that, maybe a question to start, open it up with Dil for Dylan and then open it up to the rest, which is that, you know, um, you've talked about how EPR can help at the local level, but maybe Dylan, can you talk about how well done EPR legislation could help um, local communities and provide equitable recycling access for all residents? Absolutely. I, I think a lot of the times when recycling, per, well, not a lot of the times, so as the recycling system has grown up, it has really provided inconsistent access for its residents. Um, you know, I mean, the map behind me, you have you have large cities like Indianapolis, for instance, where, you know, only a, sing, a, a single digit percentage of the residents who live there have the same access to recycling that they do to trash. And extended producer responsibility or producer responsibility can help rationalize that system, bring that access to everyone. And another really big piece and something that the, the industry is really working very hard on is the multifamily space. Multifamily uh, households are often regulated differently at the municipal level. Uh, sometimes they're, they're uh, regarded as commercial entities. And so in many communities, the you know folks who have single family homes have different access to recycling than they do to solid waste disposal and producer responsibility provides a path forward for that to be able to build an actual system to be able to deliver that infrastructure as well as those operational components to be able to make sure we're not losing all those materials we're increasingly urbanized society more and more of us are moving to urban centers and the, those urban centers are not as well served by uh, especially those in multifamily households are by by uh, as, as their single family counterparts. And that's something that is important to make sure that we're giving that again, that equitable access to all Americans and all residents, not just not just folks who have single family homes. And I would note some of the challenges in rural areas as well. And maybe maybe that's um, something I could direct to, to you, Andrew. Um, could you talk a little bit about in some of the places that you work, what happens to the revenue from the sale of materials that get co gets collected and how that helps the system? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the, the revenue gets netted back into, into the system. So you have, if you will, the, the, the overall costs of, of running uh, the recycling collection, sortation, and, and other critical features, for example, like, you know, consumer information, you know, programs that, that empower, you know, consumers, you know, to, to be enthusiastic and, and effective participants in the recycling system. Like, I think, you know, consumer information programs are a great investment, you know, to make, you know, out of, out of the EPR budget. But so you have all of these, these system costs and then, uh, you know, at the at the end of all that work, you have bales of material coming out of sorting facilities. It could be aluminum, steel, fiber, ver various types of plastic resins, and what have you. And these materials have market value. Um, within a very well-run EPR system, market development is part of the the operations, and that is something that gets paid for, you know, out of EPR is to develop deeper and stronger markets. But the point is, when the material gets sold. And that revenue comes in, it gets netted out against the system cost, you know. And you know, let's let's you know dare to you know be optimistic that if we really developed a, a great great system over time, the revenues from the high quality, well sorted materials would be so significant that it could net out most of the cost. But it, that's that's just a critical feature of 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 how EPR should work, and also how recycling more generally should work, where. Um, you know, we've got post-consumer materials that have strong market value. Thank you. And so it was good to hear some optimism, right? We, we talk a lot about the problem. So maybe um, before I go to audience questions, I'll, I'll turn to Roberta. Because Roberta, I think you did a really good job um, talking about both sort of the challenges and the opportunities. But I wanted to just ask you, you know, um, what concerns you the most given all of these challenges and, and what gives you the most hope um, moving forward? The concerns me the most one is a little, a little, uh, it's hard to, hard to exactly say in that one, but I'll stay optimistic today and say what gives me the most hope. I've worked on in my 20 years now, um, which has gone very fast in DC, working both on the nonprofit side and for the government, worked on a number of issues that are a little esoteric or don't have the kind of consensus that this one has. Um, and it's really that consensus that brings me hope. I had the privilege of joining the American Beverage Association in a number of conversations with different um, senators and members of Congress on the House side. And they all knew about this issue and they all wanted to do something about it. Um, recycling is so personal. 
I've never heard somebody say before, but I heard this from multiple members of Congress. I'm a passionate recycler um, on both sides of the aisle. And so many different stories of I had this thing and I had that thing and I didn't know what to do about it and what are we gonna do about it? So you have that personal experience and then you have the industry side saying, we know that the future can't be going back to the earth time and time again to extract some material that gets packaged around some other material and then people throw it away because what else will you do with it? Just so we can go back to the earth to start that very same cycle again. Everyone knows that's not possible. And to hear commitments from America's leaders, leading brands that we're gonna actually make products out of old products through campaigns like the Every Bottle Back um, means that people are really serious and the industry is serious in meeting what we know is public demand for consistent access to recycling, easy access to recycling, and just less stuff, less stuff overall. Which means at the end of the day, it's kind of time for the government to figure out what they're going to do with the challenge that's put, been put in front of them. We've been so excited by the great momentum that's been created by Senator Sullivan, White House, and Menendez through the Save Our Seas process. We love the framework, and it's absolutely the high watermark that was established by Senators Merkley and Representative Lowenthal through the Breakthrough from Plastic Pollution Act. The American Beverage Association and others supported the concepts that are in that bill. So we have a place where we have everyone from Greenpeace to some of America's biggest companies saying this general space of reduction, reuse, refill, and circularity are something that we can get behind. So let's get going. Um, so I hope that's what the conversation today is about. That's what brings me hope. I'm excited to be testifying um, in front of the Environment and Public Works Committee tomorrow, where I will not have my five-year-old by my side and will be in person, so won't have to worry about my camera. Um, and let's just get this job done. I think everyone's ready for that. Thank you, Roberta. Um, if anyone wants to jump in, I will. we have a couple of minutes for that. Otherwise, I'll go to questions from the audience. I just want to echo the, how heartening it is to see this type of consensus around around this issue. You know, I've been working in recycling for the better part of two decades, and uh, you know, th these types of concepts came up ten years ago here in the U.S. There was not this type of consensus, and the industry itself, both both sides, have sort of evolved and and adjusted, and there is just a much greater interest. In, in supporting this type of policy. And it's just, it's extremely heartening. And I want to echo what Roberta said that, that I, I think the time is now to be able to get it done, having that consensus and that level of support. Wonderful. So with that, I'm gonna turn to some questions from the audience. I, the first one I'm gonna give you is one that, um, that I'd like to direct towards our corporate um, panel members. And, and uh, so this is a little bit of a challenging one, but um, would love to hear your perspectives. And the question is, the first two states to introduce um, packaging EPR, Maine and Oregon, were generally opposed by brands. Is this a sign that there's a disconnect between how states and brands want to design EPR programs for packaging? Chris, I'll take a shot and, and, and then please come jump in. Um, like I, I think that uh, in the, the models that, that industry has developed for really well designed EPR systems. There are, you know, a handful of critical things that that industry is looking for in terms of how to set up the system that we're we're paying for. And um, probably the, the, one of the most important is how the day to day operations of of the program get managed. And you know, in our in our view, in our industry view of a great EPR system, it really is at its core a kind of public-private partnership, where the public sector has to approve. You know, the plan uh, provides you know oversight, requires reporting, auditing, transparency, um, all these critical um, functions. But then the day-to-day -day operations of the system are run by a producer responsibility organization that, that itself would be steered by industry. And that's kind of the partnership that, that we're looking for. I think to the extent that you see any industry hesitation around some of the state proposals that are coming out these days, it's probably because the proposals aren't very bright on that point or you know, maybe a handful of other critical design features that we're looking for. I don't know, Chris, do you want to weigh in a little bit on that one as well? 
I think Andrew put it perfectly. Not a whole lot to add there. I think the conversation going forward is just, again, it's part of education. It's part of familiarity. It's part of just the maturation of the entire conversation to understand the governance. Uh, this is a little bit different framework than we're uh, used to uh, compared to other issues, for, for example. But that, that public-private partnership model and how industry can participate is going to be probably one of the biggest issues moving forward. Um, at, wearing my former Govy hat, I can tell you that public-private partnerships are something we love to talk about, but are extremely hard to actually make happen for a variety of reasons. Um, I'd like to um, throw out another question, and I'll throw this out to the, to the group at large. Um, and this is, are there any bills already introduced that have a robust EPR approach? I think I might know the answer, but I, um, I'd like to see if anyone else would like to weigh in. I think Roberta like hit to... the nail on the head there with oh, yeah. uh, Senator Merkley and, and Representative Lowenthal. Obviously, I, there may be others. I apologize if I'm missing others, but um, clearly that's a key marker uh, that we're all aware of and have been participating in the conversation and look forward to seeing how we can, um, you know, with them and grow, grow the conversation to other members of, of Congress as well around EPR. I just wanted to chime in and say that our my organization, the Recycling Partnership, is at its very core a public-private partnership. We have public we we take uh, dollars from private industry, from brands and companies, and partner with communities around the country. And that's something that is that that is hard to do. Don't get me wrong; it's not super easy, but it's something that we have succeeded in partnering with thousands of communities around the country. And you know, and and certainly, I, I you know, both the Merkley Lowenthal bill that Chris was talking about in terms of having a, a robust EPR approach. There's EPR conversations happening on the Hill. Uh, you know, EPR obviously was a component of, or study of EPR was a component of the the climate bill that was introduced. You know, and there's lots of other conversations around producer responsibility legislation that are happening right now on the Hill. So, very excited to see this engagement. Um, I I would also um, add. And just huge thanks to also the retired Senator Udall for kicking the conversation off. The Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act is absolutely the high watermark and the most inclusive legislation for the concepts of reduction, um, public-private funding, eco-modulation, global leadership, environmental justice, the whole thing. Um, so to be able to start with something um, and to see parts of industry and the public get behind that is fantastic. Um, 900,000 WWF supporters recently signed a petition in support of those kinds of concepts. That's all really great. I've been in DC long enough to be realistic that passing standalone legislation can be hard. I still think break free will pass, but I really hope that Congress will make the most of um, existing vehicles and the movement behind those vehicles to get done the good things that we can get done now. And I would include in those categories, um, public-private investments for national infrastructure, especially where the purpose for that infrastructure could be articulated. So we're not just building a road to nowhere. Um, so we're building recycling infrastructure that can actually deliver on recycled content um, with reduction goals tied to it. Um, a national bottle bill, I think makes a lot of sense um, to really get that going um, and figure out how to make the most of the incentives built into bottle deposit programs. And then finally, the um, plastic fee that's been articulated through Senator Whitehouse's Reduce Act. I think really trying to address the fact that virgin plastics are artificially cheap right now through government programs by really trying to address that price disparity and eventually address the price disparity between recycling facilities and landfill facilities as well, I think will go a long way. But let's get EPR and the full package done while taking advantage of that momentum. Thank you, Roberta. Um, I, I want to build on that question about infrastructure and ask one more question and then we'll, we'll wrap up, which is how do you bring in EPR nationally when many parts of the country do not have recycling infrastructure yet for their municipalities? And I think we're trying to get at that answer in, in our conversation, but I would like to throw it out to the, to the panel to see if they have any comments. Yeah, I, I'll I chime in. Oh, go ahead, Andrew. No, 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 Dylan, you go first. I'll go next. Well, I, I was going to say, and I, I, I threw the uh, the policy report that we led on that talked about that seventeen billion dollar number that that uh, that was referenced earlier. That infrastructure need is 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 
is easily handled under a producer responsibility program. That that is the type of thing when you when you are building a, a, a well designed EPR program or producer responsibility program, you do a needs assessment, and that needs assessment is going to be different depending on where where it is, and that is where that capital investment and that activity may happen. Some places, like here on the West Coast, there already is robust infrastructure for you know our on, in the Northeast as well for most of the communities that that are in those states. Uh, and then other parts of the country where there isn't, that is where a producer responsibility would do that type of investment that would be targeted by that type of needs assessment that would be outlined in statute. Yeah. Yeah, if you're, if you're a community that wants to improve, you know, recycling, including establishing it from the ground up, you should be pro EPR. And, you know, the guidance could come from, from, you know, the federal government, minimum standards from the federal government, but it's going to cascade down. And in the planning that Dylan was just talking about, the needs assessment, um, communities that, that need to expand recycling access, in, in, invest in you know, consumer information campaigns, retrofit the MERS, that's going to come out in the needs assessment. And as I said at the, at the outset of my remarks, EPR is a financing mechanism to make that happen. So. Chris, did you want to add anything? I see you're off mute. No, I was getting ready, but but of course Dylan and Andrew did a fine job on that one. So nothing more to add. Okay, so maybe maybe I'll go in to wrap up now. So a couple of threads I'd like to pull out from all of the presentations as well as all of the questions, which is that um, you know we know we have a problem. Uh, we think we we're starting to see some of the solutions. There is um, consensus, broad consensus among many stakeholders that extended producer responsibility should be part of the solution set. But the devil is really in the details and it's really critical that we get those right. And some of those key principles for making EPR work. And that includes ensuring that it provides um, reliable and sustainable funding and that it um, sets appropriate targets. It has an appropriate framework, um, but that it leaves the sort of operational issues um, to the stakeholders involved to sort of get it done. So I think those are sort of key, key measures or key, key, key things that have come out um, and that the benefits of this would be to help improve recycling, um, push resources down into communities, um, spur infrastructure and um, innovation. So I think, I think um, we have a lot of things that we can talk about with EPR and a lot of, this is the beginning of the conversation, but for those who are listening, particularly those from the Hill, um, I guess what I would like to leave you with is that you have a group of eager, engaged and knowledgeable stakeholders in, in this group here and elsewhere um, we could have gotten a lot more people on this panel, and, and in fact, I think we, we, we would have loved to do a bigger and, 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 and follow on events to really dig into these questions a little bit more. So um, we'd like to thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to having further conversations about this um, topic in the future. So thank you for joining us, and um, we look forward to, to seeing you again in the near future. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.